Welcome, all of you, to uh, uh, Vintage Movie Night Travel Films. I'm Hedrick Pippermill, a media ethicist. Um, you, if you were expecting uh, Richard Hall, uh, I am he. But this is a um, sort of a television pen name I use uh, occasionally uh, when it's appropriate. I apologize that we are not all together. The way to see uh, old classic classroom films and travel logs is with a group of people in an auditorium. That is the best way to um, view films like we're going to be showing tonight because they were designed to be seen in a room with an audience and you could uh, hear people laughing or, or crying. Um, you could talk to your neighbors about it when it was over but unfortunately um, you are probably now watching by yourself, on a phone, or with a, a friend, on a computer, um, in, in um, quiet desperation, rather than in a, in a group because of the coronavirus. So we thought that it would be appropriate to present vintage travel films, because you cannot travel now, most likely. If you do, um, it's probably unusual. Most of us are not able to travel. And so come with us on a virtual journey. We will be uh, traveling virtually, of course, with old films on planes, on trains, on ships and automobiles. We'll be traveling domestically and we'll be traveling internationally. Now, let's just begin right away. 1902. Uh, well, actually, we have a film from 1898, San Francisco. Uh, travel films are almost as old as cinema itself. So our first few minutes of film are silent films that were shot um, in the early days of cinema. Um, the Library of Congress has many of these films online, and you can find them at their website by searching for paper prints. Uh, now, paper prints were uh, films that were uh, made up until about 1912, and it was sort of a bureaucratic anomaly that um, the first uh, time that Thomas Edison tried to submit a film for copyright, uh, they wouldn't accept it. They had never had a, a motion picture before, and the bureaucrat didn't know what to do. So Thomas Edison, uh, uh, rather cleverly, uh, printed each frame of the film on a piece of paper, and they accepted it. And so for the first um, dozen years or more of cinema, in order to copyright a production, a company would actually make, make a paper copy of the film. Now these films actually could not be projected, but they were saved. And that was lucky because many of the films were otherwise lost. So what we're watching now um, is a uh, uh, the SS Columbia leaving from New York City. Uh, of course, none of us are going to get on a cruise ship now, uh, but if you would imagine what it was like in 1902, there, there you go. Um, <clears throat> well, of course, uh, if you had a motion picture camera in 1903, uh, what was something you would want to do? What would the audience want to see? Why not? Peking, the Forbidden City. So that's what we're seeing now. Of course, the Mutoscope Company uh, traveled to China and filmed the Forbidden City. And it must have been quite amazing for audiences to see this rather primitive, crude uh, piece of film. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov. So, we're going to have another silent film for our next choice.
Um, the, now, a place where many people like to travel, of course, um, is Hawaii. Hawaii. Um, this is from 1924, and it's a Ford educational film from the National Archives. It's from the National Archives because the Ford Motor Company in 1963 donated over uh, one million, uh, one and a half million feet of motion picture film produced between 1914 and 1940s to uh, the National Archives. Now, um, in the early days, uh, in, by 1920, um, Ford Motor Company was second only to Hollywood in the production of film, believe it or not. And um, Ford Films had a, an estimated 10 to 12 million viewers in theaters across the United States and in foreign countries as well, uh, France, Mexico, Japan. And they had a company newsletter to promote the films. And these were, um, uh, for, for general audiences, of course, they were promoting Ford motor cars, but they were also newsreels that, uh, such as this um, film that visits Hawaii, um, is, is basically a 10 minute film um, that many people, of course, could never go to Hawaii, but by watching this 10 minute film, you could see what it was like to travel to Hawaii. And it's quite a, a, an amazing film. Um, I have added a sound to this film uh, using uh, Apple's um, GarageBand program, adding some music so that it's just not completely silent. And um, you can now enjoy uh, seven minutes of a ten minute film. I cut off three minutes at the end. It's basically black and white shots of lava.
So now that we've gotten a taste of what an early um, educational travel film was like, a 1924 trip to Hawaii, uh, the 1930s Chevrolet also had newsreels. Um, they were called um, the uh, Chevrolet Leader News. And I've picked a small portion of it uh, to show you their little um, report on tiny homes. Uh, mobile homes, believe it or not, um, in the middle of the Depression, this was a big thing, and you'll learn from this um, short little uh, report that uh, Chevy uh, made these um, newsreels between 1935 and 1939. A smooth way to rough it. One million Americans today are living in homes on wheels. A quarter of a million trailers are those homes. Every day you see them skimming along the highways everywhere. With the modern automobile, there's plenty of power to pull them up the longest and toughest hills. In Trailer City, Florida, are a thousand of these homes. Their owners park for one dollar per week, plus 25 cents for electricity. The life is not expensive, for in a trailer, modern conveniences are within the reach of people of limited means many of whom could not afford them before. Cold weather is seldom a problem, for the inhabitants of this little city follow the seasons. Perhaps a month from now may find many of them 3,000 miles away, across a continent. In Trailer City, you'll find nearly every variety of home, from the one that Dad himself put together on the old farm back in Iowa, to a custom-built deluxe model that cost $8,000. A license plate, is often the only indication that the house is on wheels. As you stroll along the street, you'll find most of the homes are as unlike as their owners. But now and then, you'll find a pair of twins. This one has a huge beak that makes it look like a native pelican. Today, the house next door may be occupied by a retired bachelor banker. If it rolls away during the night, tomorrow's son may bring a barber with seven youngsters. Stores and shops, too are often found on wheels. This one is a curio shop that's almost as old and weather-beaten as the truck on which it rides. Mother still washes the dishes and most everything else. Just for instance, the lineup that makes a familiar flapping sound and the Monday morning breeze. There are plenty of leisure moments for the housewife. She just can't find a great deal of work in a one-room house. A radio in the car brings entertainment and the daily news and the automatic charging notch on the light switch helps to make sure the battery is kept fully charged, even though the car is driven only a few miles a day. Today may find the trailer family under the shadow of the palms, but tomorrow, the American travel instinct urges them away, over the highway, on spinning wheels. When the show is over, the room lights are turned on while the end title is still on the screen. The projector lamp is then turned off. As soon as the sound on the film is finished, the amplifier is turned off. If at all possible, dismantling or removal should not take place until after the audience is dispersed. Careful preparation produces successful showing. Well, next we'll continue our journey via automobile uh, to Africa. And we have a film called Wheels Across Africa. This film is actually almost an hour long, and I've selected just uh, 15 minutes of it. It's a sound film. It's narrated by the filmmaker, and his name was Armand Georges Dennis. Uh, he lived, uh, was born in 1896 and he died in 1971. He made uh, many films uh, working with his first wife and his second wife. He became a BBC personality later in the 1950s and 60s, but early on he went to remote places uh, taking uh, camera crews and um, going to places where people would normally not ever be able to go. And so this was a journey across Africa in automobiles, um, but here is a 15-minute journey across Africa, wheels across Africa.
were planning once more another voyage of adventure. This time, Africa. From Antwerp, Belgium to Paris, through France and Spain to the Straits of Gibraltar, and then down across the vast continent of Africa to the Indian Ocean. We had received the necessary permits from the British, French, and Belgian governments. We were awaiting in Antwerp the arrival of our trucks by freighter from New York. For 18 months, these trucks were to be our living quarters. Loaded with supplies, they weighed six tons apiece. A few hours later, we had the honor of being received in the royal palace in Brussels by the king and queen of Belgium. King Leopold, himself a keen photographer, minutely inspected our trucks and especially our photographic equipment. Queen Astrid talked graciously to Mrs. Dennis. Little we knew that barely a few weeks later, we were to hear in the center of Africa the tragic news of Queen Astrid's death. The hour of our official departure had come. The last interviews were given, the last photographs taken, and we were on our way. The Place de la Concorde in Paris, gray on this February morning, bitterly cold on the windswept mountains of Spain, and now the famous rock of Gibraltar faced us across the bay. We were on the docks of Algeciras, and again our truck short crossing of the Straits, which would take us to Spanish Morocco. A week after leaving Brussels, we were on African soil. Ceuta, where we land, has modern docks and a modern ramp to lead into the ancient city. But soon we strike inland and enter another world. We are approaching the sacred city of Moulay Idris. It is the time of the Grand Moussem, a famous yearly Mohammedan festival. The wealthy Arabs have come on magnificent Arabian horses. Pilgrims flock into the city in thousands and already the fantasias have begun. See them go. The finest horses and the finest horsemen in the world. Within the city, the crowd overflows everywhere. The rooftops are crowded. Thousands pour through the narrow archways into the marketplace. It is with difficulty that we make our way through the crowd and that Roy Phelps takes his pictures. Entertainers have come to the city from all over Morocco. The solemn fire dancers who hold burning coals in their hands and produce lighted torches from their flowing sleeves. The fire eaters who breathe in flames and smoke and assure the credulous pilgrims that fire is their only diet. And see this fellow, he's only breaking bottles. But wait, he does not break them as you and I. This is a bed he's making. He's very tired and wants to take a beauty rest nap. And see this one. He's not tired but hungry. No fire for him. Nothing will satisfy him but well-blended broken bottles. What an idea for a breakfast food. And here is a snake charmer, as daring as those of India. This is the African black cobra, as vicious and as deadly as the Indian cobra. Drums and flute provide the hypnotic music. And now we are approaching the long forbidden city of Fez. Every day is market day at the gates of the city, and for centuries these walls have witnessed the age-old bargaining of the East. Today is a sheep market, and hundreds of sheep tied in neat bundles neck to neck patiently await their fate. Buying and selling is thirsty work, but there comes the ever-present water carrier, and there the ever-present beggar. Through the ancient gates we enter into the city. After 30 years of French occupation, old Fez has not changed much, and it has not lost its medieval aspect and traditions. Its guilds of artisans still do their painstaking work by hand in small and dimly lighted workshops. This is a copper worker's shop, one of many hundreds. Everyone is a crude lathe turned without electric power, and artists, 
who have a deep pride in their cloth, patiently fashion objects of beauty. The medieval tradition of the apprenticeship still survives. It takes many years to graduate from the spinning wheel to the big looms on which the famed intricate Moroccan rugs and blankets are woven. In a tailor's shop, the tailor sits cross-legged. This complicated braiding is necessary to the making of the Arab burnous. And these children will spend their whole youth in learning its hundreds of possible patterns. See the potter at work. Out of a shapeless lump of clay, his hands can produce any graceful shape. They need far more skill than those of his apprentice, who has only learned to decorate his master's work. Someday, no doubt, the narrow streets will make way for wide arteries with clanging streetcars and motor buses. Power lines will run everywhere. The children will be taken out of the dark little workshops and sent to school. But much of the charm of Fez will be gone as well as its squalor. There will remain only its gorgeous mosaic gates and its lovely minarets to bear witness to its colorful and fascinating past. A formidable barrier of mountains separates the fertile plains of Morocco from the barren wastes of the Sahara Desert. Here, in Africa, are huge cedars and pines and often heavy snow. We had left Europe in winter and had had bitterly cold nights in the mountains of Spain. We were back again in snow and ice. And in our first camp in the Atlas, the water in our radiators froze and we had to chip ice off the windshields. Africa is a country of contrast. Look at this hooded figure passing in a setting so unfamiliar. Look at the telephone lines, for we are still on a thoroughly modern road. The military road across the Atlas Mountains, superbly engineered and built by the French Foreign Legion for the opening up of France's huge African Empire. Away once more, we are now swiftly going down the southern side of the mountain range. We learn to appreciate good hydraulic brakes on roads like these. In less than four hours, we will pass from a temperature well below freezing to the almost intolerable heat of the desert. At six in the morning, we were struggling in snow and ice. At 11, we are in the Zeez Valley, and the temperature has reached 110. We are carrying over 800 gallons of gasoline in our tanks, filled to capacity, and even in tins on the roof of the trucks. A brilliantly green carpet of date palms is laid in the bottom of the valley, and towards this cool and lovely garden, the road gradually takes us down a series of rocky and barren escarpments. The mountain streams have made the Zeez Valley one of the most fertile in the world, and it is dotted with picturesque villages. The rivers on the southern side of the Atlas Mountains never reach the ocean. They lose themselves and disappear in the Sahara Desert. We cross them on the Foreign Legion's bridges, with an inch to spare on either side, and we enter the Sahara. Reject from your mind all you ever heard about the Sahara being just one huge ocean of sand. There is in the Sahara every kind of barren and forbidding landscape. Huge rocky cliffs, mountain ranges, tumbled masses of rock. In the deepest valleys along its northern as well as its southern edge lie the oases. Graceful palms, the vivid green of which contrasts almost violently with the orange-red of the sand dunes and the deep blue of the sky. For several hundreds of miles before we enter the absolutely barren desert, they will dot our course, and rough tracks hard on tires but easy enough going for our powerful dodgers connect them with civilization. The oasis villages still cling to the sides of the mountains. In the coolness of the morning, there is busy activity on the roofs. Even the goats live on the roofs. There is the mass. The muezzin appears, summoning the faithful to prayer. The sun soon beats down unmercifully on the narrow streets, but there is cool shade along the mud walls and in the dark and crooked passages.
and there is little hard work to do, at least for the men. The men don't even walk when they can help it. But there is one work which the women do, and which goes on all day long. The whole life of the oasis depends on the water of its wells. There are lovely biblical scenes at the wells of the women filling and loading their water jars. Every drop of the precious water must be carried up the steep stairways to the village. Villagers in the forest, life goes on as it has for centuries. After a few hours, our presence ceases to disturb, and we can watch the placid communal life of the village. The women are always at work. Here they are shelling beans, a staple of the local diet. The men do the hunting or the fishing. These people live almost entirely on frogs, or rather on tadpoles, which are caught in traps made of local reeds and vines. The traps are concealed among the reeds along the edge of the lake and the unwary tadpoles blunder in. There is little of the excitement of the chase. The fisherman pulls his canoe along and picks up the trap. You and I could do it. But it takes a good deal of skill to steer the canoes on a straight course. The shape of the canoe is determined by the shape of the tree. And many canoes have a strong tendency to travel in circles. Outside every fisherman's hut, the day's catch is set to dry in the sun. Tadpoles hold all the vitamins in the world. The most powerful and good-looking fellows we saw in Africa were invariably men who lived on fish or tadpoles. These, well-dried and crisp, and an occasional full-grown frog will make a delectable meal. The barber shop is conveniently located on Main Street. A special study will be made of your profile to choose the style of hairdress which suits your type best. is deposited in a neat little pile. This is Congo's own soapless shave. No brush, no lather, and the closest shave you ever had in your life. Different styles prevail not only in hairdress, but in the elaborate patterns tattooed by cutting the skin of the face and of the body. Many of these patterns are tribal in character and indicate the tribe and even the village of the owner of the tattooing. But there is room for a lot of individual fancy in the exercise of personal taste. that his teeth have been carefully filed to a point and the two front teeth knocked out. She was camera shy and strongly objected to our taking her pictures. Our arrival in a village was usually the occasion for general rejoicing. The drums would be quickly set up. Everyone would run into his hut and return with their most elaborate costumes. not lampshades or baskets. They are Negro hats woven from local fiber. The wearer of the masks personify the chimpanzees of the forest, and their grotesque evolutions are supposed to imitate those of the chimpanzees. Note the plate lip, the huge plug inserted in the upper lip. By this time, the orchestra has appropriated the platform on the sedan.
Why don't we now go from automobiles to aeroplanes? Of course, um, uh, getting on an airplane is not something everyone would like to do right now at this moment uh, in, during a pandemic, but um, in 1959, Pan Am made this film called Six and a Half Magic Hours, and it was um, celebrating the fact that uh, now people could fly with a jet across the Atlantic from New York to Paris in only six and a half hours. And that really hasn't changed much. Uh, it's still six and a half hours uh, with the jet stream. Of course, against jet stream, it's uh, about eight hours. Um, but um, uh, the inside of the plane and the food they serve uh, is, of course, uh, much different than it is now. Uh, there's much more space, and there's china and glass and silverware and these things. Um, and so here is six and a half magic hours. Enjoy this flight with Pan Am Airlines, 1959. Sky over the Atlantic, the vast air ocean that must have stretched endlessly for Columbus when he sailed from Europe to America a few hundred years ago in over two long months. The same air ocean over the Atlantic probably did not seem as endless to Charles A. Lindbergh when he flew from New York to Paris some 30 years ago. But still, it took over 33 lonely hours. Today, that same Atlantic air ocean, leaving Columbus two months and Lindbergh's 33 hours in its wake, zooms by in a dramatic breakthrough. The year 1954 marked an historic event in the history of aviation. A new flight was inaugurated. It was called Flight 1000. There was nothing unusual about airport operations before Flight 1000's takeoff. It was duly announced and passengers checked in. Flight 1000's destination, London. Luggage was prepared for loading, and all other routine pre-flight activities were taking place. 1,000 seemed to be just another flight to London, in all respects except that its passenger list was twice as large as on ordinary trips. Flight 1000 was airborne, but no plane was used. This was the first of so-called airline paper flights, a complete simulation of an actual flight that's been repeated more than 2,000 times since. The reason? To prepare for the revolution in transportation that is now here, the advent of commercial flying by Jet Clipper. In those early days, weather information for Flight 1000 and all the other paper jet flights was gathered as carefully as if real jets were to cross the Atlantic, gaining invaluable advance information about jet travel. For example, it is now known that at the altitudes at which jets cruise, generally 30 to 40,000 feet, flying will be above the weather. After years of paper flights like number 1000 and many hundreds of real flights with prototypes, the jet age is now here. The jet age begins before takeoff at the airline's new terminal, now under construction at Idlewild Airport, New York. Jets are parked around it, as in this model. Passengers will board by walking along a covered ramp directly to the cabin level. Ground transportation delivers travelers directly to check-in counters. 
the circular design of the terminal, along with its unique cantilever roof, will assure speed of service and convenience for passengers. This is it, the first American commercial jet capable of economical transatlantic service, the Boeing 707 Jet Clipper. First to go aboard cargo and mail. Cargo shipments will be able to reach Europe in just six and a half hours. A letter posted in London or Paris after the close of business may arrive in New York the same night and be waiting for the addressee at his breakfast table or office the next morning. Speed is a byword for every part of jet operations. Since with some arrangements of seats, more than 150 passengers can be accommodated, there is an entrance at the back and the front while plane servicing facilities are on the far side. One indication of the staggering impact of jet travel, every one of the airline's dozens of jet planes can carry as many people in a year's time as the biggest ocean liner. Last item aboard, the purser's briefcase, containing log, manifest, and other necessary documents. For the crew, ready to taxi to the runway now, fewer instruments than on propeller-driven craft, and engines that are so much easier to handle and maintain. The magnificent new jet, with a wing spread that's bigger than the entire distance of the Wright brothers' first flight. Take off, without any need for engine warm-up with outside noise now reduced to no more than that of propeller-driven planes, capable of traveling at 575 miles per hour or more, much higher and faster than you've ever flown before. The first passenger jet clipper to fly the Atlantic. Because of its greater size and speed, it will do the job of several of the biggest propeller-driven planes. Welcome aboard. Welcome aboard the spacious cabin, attractively decorated, air-conditioned, but draft-free. Newly designed individual overhead light units are an innovation. Roominess extends even to the powder rooms, which look like those in a private home. And a new sensation, complete absence of vibration. Near sonic speed, but inside one of the most stunning discoveries. There is no feeling of movement at all, no vibration, hardly any sound. A new concept in air transportation. The travail has been taken out of travel. Ladies and gentlemen, this is your captain speaking. We are now at cruising altitude, 35,000 feet. Our flying speed is 575 miles per hour. In addition, we're benefiting from a substantial tailwind by courtesy of the jet stream. Hence, our ground speed is now uh, approximately 658 miles per hour. Indications are that our arrival at London Airport may be ahead of schedule. I'll be speaking with you again from time to time. Thank you. This is the atmosphere on a jet clipper flight. Delicious food adds to the enjoyment. It's prepared in four simultaneously operating galleys where dishes can be cooked in five-minute ovens. of living room quiet and relaxation. The mood enhanced by lighting that can be changed from the pale pink of dawn through all the variations to the dark blue of night. Ladies and gentlemen, this is your captain again. I've just been talking with flight control at London Airport. 
The temperature there is 64 degrees and the weather is clear. If you haven't already changed your watches to conform to the time difference, I suggest you do so now. We are now making our descent. I won't be speaking to you again as we'll be in our landing pattern over London in the next few minutes. It was a pleasure to have you aboard our jet clipper. We hope to have you with us again soon. Thank you. to London in the same time that it takes you to go and see a baseball doubleheader. New York to London in six and a half magic hours. It all goes so fast now and it's so comfortable that you feel as if you hadn't traveled at all. Many hours gained and no sleep lost. London, the splendid ceremony called Trooping the Color, celebrating the Queen's birthday. And you arrive not only with more time on hand, but also not travel fatigued. You can take in the scenes and events more fully and at a more leisurely pace. Only one of the remarkable gains made possible by jet flying. to Paris, seven hours, only 30 minutes longer than to London. Paris, right away you're in the swim of things, because once more you've landed refreshed and with extra hours to do what you want to do in a leisurely way. Experiences like these, which used to be rare events for the few or the few thousand, are becoming neighborly visits for the millions, because international air traffic, already increased fivefold during the last 12 years, now undergoes its greatest change. Jet speeds will help to accomplish one of man's long-sought goals, an easy interchange of peoples throughout the world. Transoceanic flights now become short hops, six and a half magic hours to Europe. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. So glad you could join us. Thank you. Um, but, um, of course, um, it's quite amazing um, seeing the insides of those planes. And I tell you what, the comfort would be good, but I do not miss all the smoke inside the plane. Oh, that must have been horrible. Um, uh, well, I experienced it myself. I'm old enough to, to remember um, the nausea by some chain smoky or sitting beside me. Uh, at any rate, um, uh, there are a series of films made by Chevrolet called Roads to Romance. Um, each one is only three minutes and they visit, um, they, they're promoting Chevrolet cars, but they're also promoting tourism and travel within the United States. And I thought that this one was rather um, uh, amusing. I uh, grew up myself in Pennsylvania and it's a, um, it's a, it's a film that promotes the modern new highway of the Pennsylvania Turnpike. Magic chair for 
tomorrow. You leave or enter this superhighway at toll gates through interchanges spaced along its 160 mile length. The Pennsylvania Turnpike, piercing the Allegheny Mountains between Harrisburg and Pittsburgh, is one of America's spectacular road building feats. Whether going east or west, you drive without interruption or delay through the ever unfolding grandeur of the Appalachians past fertile farms and spots of historic lore. Sweeping curves and tunnels carved under the lofty mountains give new zest to your driving pleasure. turnpike is a lake which in certain places bubbles continuously as if the water were boiling. This statue is but one of the many historic monuments commemorating people and places long held in deep respect by all Americans. Over this finely engineered highway the finest engineered cars carry millions of people bound on business, travel, or vacation. It was in this part of the country, too, that George Washington first gave evidence of his greatness. Fort Necessity at Great Meadows saw the then young officer fight the first real battle of the French and Indian Wars, saw the colonists unite for the first time in a common cause, and saw the first wheeled vehicle brought over the first road west of the Alleghenies. Today, you and your family can enjoy the vacation thrills of this area. And no matter where you live, you can reach it quickly, comfortably, and with utmost economy. Travel this year the roads to romance, to places you have always wanted to go. And when you travel, Go in one of the quality motor cars your neighborhood Chevrolet dealer has to offer. It will be your magic carpet that will carry you to the land of your heart's desire. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. So glad you could join us. Thank you. Oh, oh thank you very much. Now we've traveled by automobile and we've traveled by jet uh, why don't we now go on to a cruise ship? Uh, this is a, a, a delightful little 10-minute uh, film. Uh, it's called Over Sapphire Seas, and it was made by the Panama Pacific Steamship Company in 1934, obviously promoting their modern uh, ships at that time and, and the comfort and all the activities that you would have on a cruise ship somewhere that nobody watching this would want to be right now, I'm sure. thousand joyous miles of sun-swept ocean wave are ahead of you as you leave New York for the two weeks coast-to-coast -coast voyage. California is at your journey's end and Havana and Panama with the marvelous canal are ports of call between. As the great ship takes up her course she gathers speed silently and surely through the miracle of electric propulsion. Two great driving motors together exert 17,500 horsepower noiselessly and without vibration. The engineers at their posts and the captain and his officers on the bridge assure a precision of movement throughout the voyage to which earlier navigators were strangers.
On a map of old buccaneering days may be traced the ship's route through romantic seas in the wake of the old sea rovers. How much the buccaneers missed in not being able to drop in for a friendly day's visit at colorful Havana and delightful Panama. With your first full day at sea, the pleasant routine of the voyage begins, perhaps with exercises in the gym or an informal setup drill on deck. Or, if you are particularly kind to yourself, breakfast in bed. After breakfast, shopping may be indulged in. The ship's novelty shop carries an excellent display of foreign perfumes, articles of clothing, including bathing suits, toilet accessories, books, photo supplies, and travel souvenirs. Another service feature on board is an alluring playroom for the children, with an understanding nurse in charge, relieving mothers of many an hour of parental care. On every voyage, a children's party is given, usually with the captain in command. Every day by mid-forenoon, life on deck is in full swing. Sky deep blue, sea rippling and sparkling under a gentle trade wind, the ship speeding steadily on. At such a time, mere living is a delight, and as Walt Whitman says, you may truly loaf and invite your soul. The broad promenade deck has the animation of the boardwalk at a fashionable shore resort, and refreshment is not wanting, an important consideration in the brisk sea air. Stewards here serve bouillon at 11 and tea at 4. Sports go on vigorously every day. Shuffleboard, the seagoer standby, and deck tennis, a lively game, played with rings instead of balls, and developing skill and exciting emulation in young travelers. But the palm of popularity must go to water sports, for the two great deck pools, each holding nearly 90 tons of sea water, are in use from morning to night. Girls sprint for a prize and do stunts. This they call the snake crawl. Underwater pictures may be taken with the camera at the bottom of the pool photographic novelties originating on the Panama Pacific Line. A lad wins a contest by picking up plates at a depth of eight feet. Watch him come up. Two cameras were used for this. Action, comradeship, and comedy, with youth at the helm and pleasure at the prow, mingle at the swimming meet. <laughs> Even the ship's fat man contributes a stirring number to the program as he does his stuff in the pool. At the end of the day in the open and preceding dinner, 
comes the social hour in the softly lighted smoking room. Below decks, more than 200 experts in service follow their allotted tasks, intent on producing and serving perfect meals. The butcher is proud of his heavy cuts of prime beef. Meat cooks broil thick steaks over charcoal, the only fire in the big electric kitchens. The bakers turn out their loaves from electric ovens using 15 tons of flour in the course of a round trip. Fish and roasts and soups are cooked by huge electric ranges. There are 10 of them. In the dining saloon, seating 300 or more, individual orders or formal meals are served with equal care. And what is important in sailing through the tropics, in a measured temperature, for the room is air conditioned. Evening brings its own diversions. Once on the voyage, a fancy dress ball is held and improvised costumes win laughs and prizes. Ooh. <clears throat> time out, time out, stop, stop. We're gonna stop the film right there. Why is it that in the 1930s and many times in our country's history, people felt that it was, you had to have put blackface on and make fun of minorities in order to have fun and that um, horrid party they were having there would you we're stopping the film right there so let's move on now okay so automobiles jet planes ships now let's go on a train this is called the passenger train uh, this is a a true uh, classroom film a classic classroom film made by Erpy. Uh, which was a um, one of the leading uh, producers of classroom films uh, from the 1930s all the way through the 1970s. Um, there also were um, Encyclopedia Britannica later on, but uh, in their early films they were called ERPI, E-R-P-I. And um, it basically shows what it was like uh, 10 minutes. Uh, you'll see what it was like to travel on a train in 1940 when um, train travel was much more common than it is now and perhaps uh, we'll go back to that again someday. Uh, but here is um, the passenger train. Up to this large railroad station come buses, taxis, and private cars carrying people who are going to travel by passenger train. At the entrance to the station, the cars stop and the people get out. Thousands of people pass through here every day on their way to and from trains. If their train is not ready, they may stay in this large waiting room, walking about or sitting on big benches. They must go to the ticket window and get tickets before going to the train. Inside each window is a ticket seller. Each one who rides on the train must buy a ticket to the place where he is going. Money from tickets helps pay the cost of running the trains. Near the trains are gates through which passengers must go. A gateman looks at the tickets to be sure that each passenger is on his way to the right train. It is almost time for this passenger train to leave the station and the passengers are hurrying along the glistening sides of its coaches. The train will be pulled by this big streamlined diesel electric locomotive. Its engines are warming up and inside the cab sits Mr. Schroeder, the engineer who has driven locomotives for many years. He is always ready. Inside the locomotive further back is the attendant, the engineer's assistant. He stays close to the big motors for his job is to keep them in good running order. 
burned gases from the engines go out through these pipes in the top. Each passenger can take a trunk with him free, and the last of these is going into the baggage car. Into another car go the last bags of mail. Carrying mail also helps pay the cost of running the train. Inside the mail car, railway mail clerks put together papers and letters for each town or city. The conductor, Mr. Owens, is in charge of the train. All aboard. All aboard. He signals the engineer. The train must start exactly on time, and now Mr. Schroeder must go to work. All the doors along the train are closed, and the engineer opens the throttle. Sand keeps wheels from slipping on their path of smooth steel rails. Wider and wider the throttle is open. The long train gathers speed as it winds its way along the tracks. Leading from the gates at the big station are many tracks, which gradually join each other farther out. A train dispatcher knows on which track each train should run, and he switches each to its proper track. The trains run under banks of signals which show the engineers whether they should go ahead or stop. Here is a signal ahead now. It is set for stop. Mr. Schroeder, the engineer, with hand on the brake, sets the air, and iron brakes close on the wheel. Now the signal changes to go. And again, the powerful locomotive pulls the train ahead. It is safe now to pass the signal. Inside one of the coaches, Mr. Owens, the conductor, is already taking up tickets, making sure that each one has paid for his ride. The passengers have comfortable seats. They can sit up or lie back easily if they want to rest. Overhead, out of the way, are racks filled with bags and parcels. The cars of the train are joined snugly together by a part called the vestibule. A highway crossing is ahead. Now Mr. Schroeder closes the throttle to slow down the train, for a sharp curve is just ahead. The engineer knows exactly how fast he can go with safety. The train is passing under a safe highway crossing built above the tracks. And now it runs alongside a river. The river valley is level, so it is an easy place to build level tracks. The last car on this train is called the observation car. Plenty of windows and seats all about. Here there are desks where passengers may write letters, and easy chairs and lounges where they may sit comfortably and chat with each other while they enjoy such sights as this beautifully winding stream. These men are whiling away the time playing cards. Those in the observation car now see a long freight train, cattle cars, empty coal cars, and a powerful steam engine. Soon, the train is going through a deep cut made in a hillside so the tracks could still be level. And now it approaches a tunnel, a big hole bored through a high, steep hill. This tunnel is at historic Harper's Ferry. Wow. 
over the Potomac River from the state of Maryland into the state of West Virginia. It is meal time for the passengers and this is the dining car, an excellent restaurant that is part of the train. The steward shows the people to their seats and gives them menus, large cards with lists of food, so that each can choose the kind of food he likes. Some are already eating. A dining car is a great convenience to people traveling long distances by train. The food is brought in by waiters who are clever at balancing their large trays as the train speeds along. When the diners have decided what they want, the waiters go into the kitchen and repeat their orders to the chief cook, who is called the chef. He must keep many kinds of food on hand. The cooks are clean, and the kitchen of the dining car, although small, is kept spotless. A good meal in the dining car is a pleasant event for passengers during a long ride. Up in his cab, Engineer Schroeder has no thought of food. He must watch the track ahead. The safety of all the passengers depends on his skill and watchfulness. His train approaches a small village and dashes on through. The big steel rails sag under the weight of the rushing train. Onward, as darkness falls outside, the ever-watchful engineer speeds his passengers. It is almost bedtime. The Pullman porter begins to change seats into beds, taking out backs of seats to make bottoms for beds called berths. Above the seats, he unlocks a big curving door, and inside finds more articles for making up the berth. Mattresses, sheets, and pillows. Some he takes out of the berth for the one below and others he will use for the berth above. Those who are not yet ready for bed may have tables, magazines, newspapers, and writing materials with which to while away the evening. And always Mr. Schroeder alertly watches his locomotive and the track ahead in the dark of night, through villages, around curves, through cuts and tunnels, over high bridges. The porter, having made up these two berths, puts in position a little ladder for the passenger who is to sleep above. Through the night rushes the train, its headlights shining on the rails of the track. The attendant, ever on watch over his motors, they are watching the track ahead. The safety, the lives of all his passengers depend on the skill and watchfulness of the locomotive engineer. Uh. Let's go visit Haiti in vivid color in 1942. This is from the Prelinger archives, and um, the, the copy is um, the best copy I could find is not the greatest, but um, I think it it, it it does the job. If you love tales of the sea, you probably have read many times of the Windward Passage. You traverse its salty expanse when you sail around the southeast end of Cuba, largest island of the West Indies. Should you go straight out from that southeast end of Cuba, as Columbus did on the 6th of December, 1492, and breast the intervening 50 miles of foaming, rushing blue water with its flying fish and screaming seabirds, you will come next to the second largest island of the romantic archipelago, an island wholly in the tropics. It is a cluster of steep mountain tops arising from broad bases on the ocean floor to make a heavily broken patch of terra firma about the size of our own rugged state of Maine. From the water level, though, the mountains are not very high. Even the tallest is under 9,000 feet. When Columbus saw this particular island, 
He called it Hispaniola, the Spanish. But the million or so Awak Indians who were there before him already had a name for it. They called it IT, Land of Mountains. The name still varies, for today it comprises no less than two of the republics of the Western Hemisphere. The Dominican Republic occupies perhaps two-thirds of the area. What appears here is Port-au-Prince, capital city of the other, the Republic of IT, on the western third of the island. An excellent harbor encourages shipping, and Port-au-Prince has the additional advantage of being on an important air route between North and South America. In Columbus's day, the Indians thought that he came out of the sky in ships that really were great birds. The Spaniards were amused. But today, strangers from afar actually do descend on IT from the sky. Port-au-Prince is IT's capital in all respects, not only in transportation or in trade. The imposing twin-towered Notre Dame Cathedral there is the spiritual center for most of the citizens. The impressive National Palace, where the president lives, represents political authority. And here, the National School of Medicine is a convenient symbol of higher education in a country where the population is approximately 275 persons to the square mile. That is a density greater than is recorded for any other republic in the Americas. The local marketplace at Port-au-Prince shows a much greater density, but it is merely the gathering spot of small tradesmen who deal principally in perishable foodstuffs for metropolitan consumption. One finds here, in rich volubility, that a special variation of French which is called Creole. The people speak French, but over 90% of the population is of African origin. IT is one of the few independent Negro nations in the world. No point in lingering over the marketplace now, though. It's lunchtime, and practically everybody is stopping for a snack and a snooze. It is not especially hot. A breeze almost always blows in from the sea to keep the temperature at an average of 75 degrees to 85 degrees, summer and winter. While the teeming marketplace slows down into its noonday quiet, we are given an opportunity to look into some of the other parts of the town. Dwellings are not pretentious. Structures of more than one story are uncommon. But each is its owner's castle. It is the house of a free man. In that concept, let us overlook the rude construction, the lack of facilities that we have come to regard as our everyday conveniences. For these people have something infinitely more precious than material wealth. In a world that is battling the last stand of despotism, these citizens of IT, like us, are blessed with liberty. IT's memories of her upward struggle show most clearly in her popular celebrations. The signs are varied and interesting. They show clearly with but one exception. Where could an Anglo-Saxon maypole have come from? Your guess is as good as any. But these men with high ceremonial headdresses, how reminiscent they are of processional figures in days of the Spanish conquest. Here are children waiting to join the celebration, purporting to be those Indian Aborigines who greeted Columbus. Unhappy people they were. Conquered, enslaved, and worked to their last ounce of energy, those Indians died completely off in 25 years. They died mainly because they had known freedom and could not live without it. Whole centuries were to pass before IT would really know freedom again. In 1517, Negro slaves were brought from Africa to repopulate the island. The French took over in 1697, constantly adding more slaves to increase the yield of their large plantations, and by such slave labor, making IT extremely rich in trade. These grotesque figures are memories of that century of the plantations. Through the tangle of these survivals comes to the powerful racial origin in Africa, the chief factor in the mysterious, smoldering, shuddery voodoo of IT. Thus, the Aitians obey the eternal human impulse to remember and to drive home to themselves over and over again the outstanding lessons in their turbulent history. Modern things such as automobiles and jazzy saxophones joining in further to confuse the bewildered tourists. IT was the second nation of the new world to establish an independent government. January 1, 1804, when this was done, 
mark not only a birth of independence, but an emancipation from slavery. The greater part of the Republic is situated on two large peninsulas, and that gives a relatively small country an extraordinarily long coastline. It has no less than 14 seaports. Among these is the city's second in importance, Cap Aitien. Columbus built a fortress here. But tourists come to Cap Aitien less for Columbus than to visit the nearby village of Milo and the mountain that towers above it. For Cap Aitien was the seat of government in the tumultuous days of King Henri Christophe. And his palace, which he called Saint Souci, at the village of Milo, was where he entertained his courtiers. Christophe was one of the black leaders who arose with Toussaint Louverture, freeing their fellow slaves and driving out the French who had ruled them for more than a century. On the trail above the ruins of Saint Souci, the tourists make their two and one half to three hours climb to the 2,600 foot level where a far more magnificent pile attests the glory that was Christophe's. He was a monarch then, self-crowned king of IT. There is the place, the century-old citadel La Ferrière. Christophe built it as a last stronghold should he ever need one. Actually, when he died in 1820, it was by his own hand, stone walls and high inaccessibility of no avail. He feared his enemies, and with reason. Back of each of the 365 windows in his citadel was a cannon aimed at intruders who never came. Yet, if Christoph had vast faults, he had grander virtues. As an administrator, he did much to raise his people. He established schools, built roads, encouraged agriculture. The Citadel failed his purpose, no doubt, but it serves another that he did not anticipate. It is a solemn reminder to tourists who clamor thoughtlessly over the moss-covered ramparts that all North America owes a lasting debt to IT. It stands for the great change at the opening of the 19th century in Europe's attitude toward the New World, the end of her fond dreams of American conquest. The train of disasters that Christophe and his fellows caused the French persuaded Napoleon that the price of Western Empire was too great. He suddenly decided to sell out the United States making that the Louisiana purchase from him for $15 million. So perhaps to those who use more than their eyes in looking at IT, there is neither stick nor stone nor living thing in all the Republic which does not somehow symbolize the spirit of our own liberty. Our proud history might be far less than it is if Christoph and his fellows had never lived or had prized their freedom less. We're going to 1939, and we're going to visit our friends south of the border, the people of Mexico. This is another Erpi film. It's 10 minutes. And um, I always find it interesting not just to visit Mexico, but always keep in mind that you're, you're visiting Mexico from the perspective of an American production company in 1939, and their point of view and how they see Mexico then. So it's not just a pure geographic exercise of visiting Mexico. You're also visiting the mindset of America towards Mexico. And that's one of the great values of watching old archival uh, classroom films. So uh, let's roll it. An assistant is at the light switch. It is time to start. The projectionist gives the signal and the curtains are closed. The assistant turns out the light, and the show has begun. Everything properly prepared in advance ensures a good film showing. On the central plateau of Mexico, there stand many stately monuments to the advanced nature of its ancient civilization. This is the towering Pyramid of the Sun, one of the world's largest pyramids. Quetzalcoatl, the plumed serpent, was the great Taltec teacher. Under Quetzalcoatl and his subordinates, these civilizations were far advanced in art, surgery, and astronomy. The 12-foot calendar stone of the Aztecs was as accurate as calendars of today. Across this ancient culture, the Spaniards, bearing the cross, 
but more effectively the cannon, forced their way in the 16th century, a conquest symbolized by this Spanish-type building erected on a ruined pyramid. Today, the paved roads of the Spanish invaders remain, and bridges centuries old but usable. Aqueducts for carrying the precious water. Today, three types make up Mexico's population. This man is of pure Spanish ancestry. For 300 years, the Spanish ruled Mexico. This man is a mestizo, a mixture of Spanish and native Indian blood. The third division of the population is of pure Indian stock. Of central importance in Mexico's story is the hacienda, or large land holding, into which the country was divided after the Spanish conquest. The landlords lived on one side, and on another side of the huge hacienda enclosure lived the Indian natives and mestizos who worked the lands for a share of the crop. In the big house lived the owner and his family. Close by was the chapel, where religious services were held. Daily, the workers labored in the broad fields, vast tracts which often included thousands of acres. However, in 1917, in the Chamber of Deputies, Mexico began to return some of the land to the farming people. Many of the huge holdings were divided. The Indian and the mestizo, who had long toiled for others, now had their own land to till and to receive from it the full reward of their labors. The huge plantations of the maguey plant from which the popular native drink pulque is made are reminiscent of the old hacienda system. Here we see one of a large number of workers approaching with his donkey to gather sap from the plants. In the center of the huge cactus-like arms of the maguey plant, the sap oozes out into a basin. The long gourd with one end open and a hole in the other provides an implement by which the worker draws up the sap. When the supply has been taken from the plant, it is carried over and emptied into one of the casks strapped to the back of the donkey. Many workers, even today, are employed on these large land holdings. The pride in possession of their own lands, however, is reflected in the home life of the workers. This mestizo housewife is drawing water for the evening meal. The typical adobe house construction is in evidence. A bed mat of coarsely woven grass stands by the door. While grandmother watches over baby, she does fine hand needlework. She uses the sewing machine only for coarser work, on clothing, for example. The evening meal will be much like others. Cakes or tortillas from cornmeal, ground as needed, will form a principal part. The Mexican housewife may spend as much as six hours daily grinding meal from corn on the metate or grinding stone, the most important article of furniture in every rural household. Now, as the first wet corn meal is being ground to the proper consistency, the cooking fire is lighted. Baby's swinging cradle keeps him amused and off the earthen floor. Each handful of corn grains is first ground into coarse meal and finer on each regrinding. This household skill is a required part of the education of the Mexican girl, even as the tortilla or flat corn cake is a leading part of the diet of the typical Mexican family. Aside from the grinding stone and stove, the living and dining room presents few articles of furniture. The men folks spend their days in the open air working, so plain fare and simple furniture fit well into their scheme of life. 
Tortillas and beans called frijoles are nourishing and inexpensive. The thin tortilla can be folded easily about the frijoles, or a piece of it can be used as a spoon with which the beans may be scooped up. Baby can wait for his supper until his elders have finished. The typical day in the Mexican working man's home ends with the familiar strum of guitar and the melodious folk song. fiestas come regularly and often to the people of Mexico. Decoration of the village church indicates this celebration may be partly in honor of some local saint. The general feeling, however, is one of joyous abandon with dancing and festival gaiety. This official is setting off a handmade skyrocket as a signal for the beginning of festivities. There apparently is no great hurry, however, for this man is leisurely finishing the decoration of his oxen. A donkey's headdress reflects the spirit of festivity, which again is seen in the faces of the riders. And now from all parts of the village, residents and visitors begin to throng toward the central public square. Fiesta costumes are evident everywhere among the marchers, in their dresses, hats, and other ornaments. Visitors from neighboring towns have swelled the village population from hundreds into thousands. Of the many fiesta dances, the dance of the conquest is most reminiscent of Mexico's rich history. men dress as native Indians. The children of the village dress as Spaniards. Thus, in gay fiesta time, in their folk dances, the people of Mexico relive the stirring events in their history. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. So glad you could join us. Thank you. Oh, oh, thank you very much. I thought it would be interesting to visit one of our supposed enemies in the world. Uh, in 1953, Iran uh, was um, someone who were most interested in strategically. It was the Cold War. They had oil. Um, we... Uh, uh, Kermit Roosevelt and um, uh, the, the CIA uh, apparently, well, they've admitted that themselves, they're historians, that we were um, instrumental in a coup d'etat which removed a, 
uh, democratically elected president from Iran and installed the Shah, who was there for many years, as you know. But this film, a, a color classroom film, 14 minutes long, is a profile of the country of Iran right before the coup uh, happened. gardens are covered by rose leaves. All the mountains have put on their holy dress. A thousand years ago, the poet Ferdowsi sang the praises of spring among Persia's mountains. Today, the people of Iran still look to their mountains for water, precious water for the high arid plain on which most of the people live. But too often, rivers flowing down from the snows disappear in the great central deserts of Iran. East and west lie other Muslim lands, Turkey, Iraq, Saudi Arabia, Pakistan, Afghanistan. North, the Soviet Union lies beyond the Albers Mountains. Iran knew greatness in the days when it was known as Persia. From this vast throne room, part of his renowned capital, Persepolis, King Darius ruled over the first great empire in history. The Hall of a Hundred Columns, the Haram for the many royal wives, and a wonderful sculptured stone stairway were among the marvels here. Focus of the sculptures was the life-size carving of Darius himself, seated on his throne, receiving tribute from the peoples he ruled. From Europe, Africa, and Asia came men bearing gifts. In the procession were Syrians, bringing golden bowls, bracelets shaped like horseshoes, and small horses from what is today Arabia. This was sort of tax day 25 centuries ago. There were Medes, there were Scythians from what is today southwest Russia. There were sheep from what is today Turkey. There were vessels with exotic shapes full of precious liquids. There were humpback cattle from what is today India. All these part of the Persian Empire in its days of greatest glory. There was a chariot like those of the pharaohs. Even Egypt was ruled by this Persian king and there was a Bactrian camel from what is today Afghanistan. The tax collectors were the men of his mighty army. And on these golden tablets, Darius inscribed, I am Darius, king of kings. The great god Ahura Mazda has given me the rulership of all races. This is my kingdom. Here in gold was outlined the empire which was handed to Xerxes, his son. Xerxes, at the head of vast armies, extended Persian rule to the limits of the known world. The Persian armies met defeat in Greece at the Battle of Marathon. Under Alexander, Greeks pursued the Persians back to Persepolis. Through this gateway, Alexander the Great strode in triumph. Conquerors of a different kind came a thousand years later, when in from the Arabian Peninsula swept men with flaming sword and a fiery new faith. As this new faith of Islam grew and mellowed, the followers of the Prophet Muhammad built great churches called mosques. The Masjidi Shah, the royal blue mosque of Esfahan, was completed in the 17th century by Shah Abbas. He ruled during Persia's second golden age. Polo was developed in Esfahan and played in the great square, while the Shah watched from this porch over the palace gateway. From his palace, Shah Abbas ruled a reborn, expanding Persia. He built roads, irrigation systems, and great bridges like this one. But even his empire finally crumbled. Centuries later, in 1925, Reza Shah rose to power, and a new era began, marked by a turn from old customs toward Western ways of thought. Under Reza Shah's son, needed land reforms are changing old patterns and bringing hope to the people. The young Shah's palace is typical of the architecture of modern Tehran. Former rulers lived in the Golestan, or Rose Garden Palace. In its mirror throne room is one of the world's most fabulous objects, the Peacock Throne. This golden seat of state was designed so that its occupant sat cross-legged with his back against a bolster crusted with pearls and rubies in gold settings. 
built for the great Mughal of India, it was captured by Nadir Shah and brought to Persia 200 years ago. Above is the jewel peacock from which the throne gets its name. Tehran is the capital of Iran, located in the north with the Alburz Mountains in the background. Tehran is a modern city with roots in the past. The great Muslim religious college of Sepa Salar is one of the intellectual centers of the Islamic world. These young men are studying to become mullahs, religious leaders. Their tranquil cloisters contrast with the busy life of the city. A woman wearing the enveloping shadur is a reminder that even here in this modern city are strong links with Eastern tradition. New buildings and modern apartments are among the visible signs of progress in Tehran. At their national university, young Iranians with a growing spirit of national pride are becoming the doctors, teachers, engineers, and leaders of the future. Isfahan is the art and craft center of Iran, as it was in the days of Shah Abbas, when her people boasted, Isfahan is half the world. Much of the imperial splendor survives, and in the bazaar, the ancient crafts, like coppersmithing, continue little changed. Modern machinery has come to Iran, but it still is far less difficult to hire a skilled hand craftsman by the day than to find capital to buy an imported machine to do his job. The hands of Isfahan craftsmen turn with special skill to the creation of fine articles of silver. Machinery will never be able to replace artists craftsmen like these silversmiths. Their skill is not easily acquired. For 50 years, these hands have guided tiny chisels, none over a tenth the size of a finger. With never-ending taps of his hammer, one of the world's great silver masters, Mohammed Zufan, creates things of lasting loveliness. This small case is ornamented with figures of legendary heroes, hunting lions in a scene from a Persia of long ago. The shop windows of Esfahan display other traditional arts. Here are miniature paintings. Themes used today a little changed from those of the time of the great Shah Abbas. And the technique is also little changed. Men sit all day seeming scarcely to move a muscle. His brush, three camel hairs. And this is some of the work he does. The best known product of Esfahan hands is of course the Persian rug. An average rug is made up of at least a million tiny knots, every one of which must be tied by hand. The knots make the woolen tufts or pile of the rug. The warp or foundation of the rug consists of cotton threads wound between large wooden rollers. Rug industry wages are low. One of these skilled weavers earns less in a week than an average American laborer receives for two hours work. After a few rows of knots have been tied, they are pounded tightly together with this comb-faced hammer. Children's tiny hands tie the smallest knots of the most delicate designs, although employment of children in rug factories is discouraged by new labor laws. As modern industry like this textile mill come to Isfahan, mill owners and workers alike face the problems of sudden adjustment to the machine age. Shiraz is the capital of the province of Fars, from which Persia took its name. The monumental city gates and the princely palace of the Koshkai suggest the beauty of Shiraz, whose history is full of the names of astronomers, philosophers, and poets. The climate is agreeable here. Oranges grow near reflecting pools in which Muslim poets saw the tranquility they sought in their faith. With this monument, Shiraz honors its most beloved son, the poet Saadi. 700 years ago, he wrote poetry of such beauty that it still is the basis of the living Persian language of today. The people of Shiraz are among the most progressive in Iran. Behind the caravan, still used for transport, rises their modern grain elevator. They build a fine new technical school where young men are learning to use machine tools and thus reduce Iran's dependence on foreign manufacturers. 
They point with special pride to their rapidly expanding medical school in which young people are being trained to fill the serious shortage of doctors. Some of the students are women, evidence of change disturbing to the conservative Muslim clergy. Medical care has not yet reached much of rural Iran. About 90% of the people live in villages like Kinare. Kinare exists because it has water, water drawn by this primitive hoist. Three centuries ago, elaborate irrigation systems operated. The land fed twice its present population. Today, this hoist reaches only 60 feet. Its capacity, two goatskins, about eight gallons of water a minute. Here the people of the village come to wash their clothes. And in this same water, they do their dishes. They see nothing wrong about having the sheep and goats come to drink at the same source from which they draw their water to take home for cooking and drinking. A girl named Zara carries on her head the quart of water she's walked half a mile to get. There is no school in Kinare, so Zara has not heard of the dangers of bacteria in drinking water. Kinare is cold and dusty in winter, hot, even dustier, and much more uncomfortable in summer because of the flies. At home, Zara's mother makes bread from wheat flour that was the family's share of the crop. The landlord owns the fields and also the house in which Zara and her family live. Sickness breeds easily here. It comes from dust, flies, unclean drinking water, and often just from too little soap, because soap is expensive. Main food is bread. Only occasionally are there vegetables and a little goat milk. Meat is scarce, so the diet is mostly bread and not much else. Yet for all their poverty, these people are kind and decent, honest, honorable, and friendly. Their bedding is the most precious thing they own. They have a copper samovar, a broken kerosene lantern, a teapot, a few cups and saucers, a mirror, and a picture of the Shah. Together with their clothing and cooking utensils, these things are all that this hard-working family owns. The house has two rooms, a sleeping room upstairs and a cooking room downstairs. This is the only stairway. Mother is baking bread this morning. Although Iran is rich in oil, oil products are still too expensive for this family. So mother walked 15 miles to gather twigs for her fire. As Zara's father, Mustafa, walks to work, he realizes that he is neither much better nor much worse off than his neighbors, who are neither much better nor much worse off than most of the 16 million people of Iran. And as he works in the fields with the landlord's oxen, he knows that little has changed in Kinare in 25 centuries. There is still the old system of land ownership, which sometimes requires the tenants to pay 80% of their crop for the privilege of working the owner's land. The only change is Mustafa's clothing, and now a steel tip on the wooden plow. Like most people of the Middle East, Mustafa wants the benefits of mechanized civilization. Change is coming as the great natural resources of Iran are developed. The most important resource is oil. At Abadan is one of the world's largest refineries, built to serve customers of many nations. Developed by British interests, Iranian oil has been the subject of bitter dispute. With no tradition of mechanical experience, Iranian technicians are developing skills to operate complex machinery. High industrial wages have attracted men from all over the country to work in the unfamiliar angle of technical equipment. Men from the highland tribes, men from the city bazaars, have put on the workman's helmet. This, then, is the new man of Iran, a man who looks with hope to the time when, with further development of industry and her great natural resources, Iran may know again some of the glory it knew when Darius ruled at Persepolis over the mightiest empire the world had ever known. Well, um, after visiting Iran, let's come back to uh, the, uh, the United States. Um, this is one of those short Chevrolet Roads to Romance films, and we're going to visit exciting Coral Gables, Florida. Lazy days, warm and free, pathways to climb, rivers to see, magic 
cheer for you and me as we travel the roads to Rome. A visit to Coral Gables, one of the world's most beautiful cities, may well feature a trip to the new campus of the University of Miami. Today, thronged by students from both Americas, the campus is an outstanding example of modern architecture. Fresh water swimming in the world-famous Venetian pools, fed by cool artesian wells, is open to all visitors in the area. From the mainland, a causeway stretches across sparkling Biscayne Bay to Cape Florida and to Crandon Beach, certainly one of the most magnificent bathing beaches in the world. This park area, operated as a county playground, is shaded by thousands of graceful palms and was once part of America's largest coconut plantation. Fine roads and highways bring many sightseeing points of interest in the surrounding area within easy reach of the vacationist. Here is a case of giving the visitor the bird a gaudy, colorful, and noisy costume. These macaws are completely free to fly about with no cages, nets, or fences to restrain them. You and your family can enjoy the vacation thrills of this spot, and no matter where you live, you can reach it quickly, comfortably, and with utmost economy. Travel this year the roads to romance, to places you have always wanted to go. And when you travel, go in one of the quality motor cars your Chevrolet dealer has to offer. It will be your magic carpet that will carry you to the land of your heart's desire. So glad you could join us. Thank you. Oh, oh thank you very much. 1959, Wonderful World. This is a film that was made by Coca-Cola Company, and they, they do really travel all the way around the world. Uh, apparently, they uh, featured 25 locations. It's promoting international travel, and um, it's uh, celebrating a selection of cultures on, every, on six continents. They, they don't go to Antarctica, of course. Um, but um, this is just 11 minutes of a 45-minute film. I chose a certain section to highlight some areas that we haven't visited uh, tonight yet. And uh, also, I want you to notice that um, everywhere you go in this film, it's subtle, but uh, people are drinking Coca-Cola, and it seems when they do, they're having uh, more fun, and they're, they're happier. And there is a, um, of course, as in many of these films, there is a condescension. Um, they're always stressing uh, uh, how countries are modern, or they're not modern, or they're primitive, or they're modern. And of course, the modern is much superior to the primitive. And if you listen, uh, watch carefully, you'll see uh, that attitude comes through uh, from the 1950s. So, um, here is Wonderful World in Living Color. From the earliest edges of recorded time, people had sought to make more of their lives than satisfying the everyday necessities of food and drink, clothing and shelter. The universal desire for something beautiful, something ordered and in good taste, is expressed in architecture, the arts, sports, the varying patterns of hospitality. In these designs for living, there are impressive parallels everywhere in this truly wonderful world.
touch of the enchantment, of course, is time immemorial. As of old, the caravans still journey from the desert wastes. As of old, the storytellers still gather an enraptured circle around them to hear legends more remote than the Arabian Nights, the poetry and the tall tales of the ages handed down by word of mouth and gift of speech from generation to generation. Here is theater in the round and in the original. Here, likewise, is the news of the day, the gossip, the good jokes, the glad tidings. Today's minarets stand amid the beginnings of civilization. Yet cities like Casablanca in Morocco are modern cities. More and more, there are modern homes modern, yet with accents ancient in design. The occasion for a celebration calls for lamb in this part of the world. The breaking of bread is a ritual, in thanks for the bounty of good food and good friends. To the Arabs, hospitality is not only a way of life, it is a profound business practice. There's always time for the pleasantries, the little courtesies that make life enjoyable. People relax in the bazaar before the strenuous temptations of buying and selling. Time must wait for the convivial talk of the town, even in modern cities like Cairo in Egypt. Minarets and mosques reflect the spiritual strivings of the Muslims in the way that churches and cathedrals and temples do elsewhere in the world. A ride in a felucca up the Nile is a ride up the corridor of history. The Sphinx and the pyramids, monuments enduring, monuments silent guardians, as it were, to the enchantment of the East. Up you go, Junior. And into the tombs of ancient kings. The valley of the Nile bespeaks the dawn of recorded time, built indeed for the ages some of the most ancient relics in the world. Africa is a continent of striking contrast. upon miles of dense jungle and uncharted felt. The greatest reserve of wild animals in the world, enough to enliven the tall tales of any continent. such primitive art forms as the tribal dance. Symbolic animal skins, feathers, amulets, the markings of tribal ritual. Almost within earshot of these resounding drums, there are great modern cities like Johannesburg in South Africa. 
The National Memorial in Cape Town honors the pioneers who built a new world upon this continent. There are gracious reminders of the customs and traditions of their European heritage. The family outing is a picnic, and there are beaches and coves galore in the full sweep of Cape Town Harbor. Boy meets girl at the point of rocks where the Atlantic Ocean meets the Indian Ocean. India, of course, displays a further fashioning of the fabric of enchantment. Sheer beauty, adorned, is the Taj Mahal. Like the splendor of eastern silks and satins and brocades. Boy meets girl on the wedding day. Won't you join this polite reception? The guests enjoy a lavish spread brightened by all manner of enticing spices. The bride and groom are enthroned on this happy day of days. The British poet, Kipling, wrote that East is East and West is West. Yet the twain do meet in the common desire of governments of free men everywhere. New Delhi symbolizes the new India striving forward with this ideal for so many different people of so many different religions and philosophies. At the University of Malaya in Singapore, there is again that spirit of youth universal. Serious, but not too serious. Even the newest leaders of some of the oldest civilizations on Earth can't be too sober about the prospects. There is an intricacy in Eastern craftsmanship that defies the world in its patterns of perfection. Yet it is joyous withal. In Bangkok, there is a positive gaiety in the temples themselves. This is Thailand, of course, also known as the Happy Land, the land of peace. The sound of temple bells tinkling is heard all day and all night. Dancing in Thailand is more controlled, more formal than dancing anywhere else in the world. different the rhythm, yet how similar the spirit. The night lights in Hong Kong sparkle like jewels. Would you like to eat out for a change? Chinese cuisine is absolute triumph of the culinary art. Anywhere in the world, a Chinese restaurant teases the palate with tantalizing sweet and sour combinations. Rice is basic, of course, just like chopsticks. Home was never like this, and home for many millions in the Orient is afloat aboard the junks and sampans that jam the harbor of every seaport in the Orient. In Japan, living is a delightful ceremony, entertaining guests and engaging ritual. brings the outdoors indoors, so that nature is a permanent guest in the Japanese home. So polite of people are naturally formal in all the arts. Japanese players are born to the traditions of the Japanese theater. 
And here, they enact a blood and thunder tragedy with the eternal plot of good and evil. The audience, we take it, is truly moved by the symbolic spectacle. The Philippines are known as the Pearl of the Orient, and the capital, of Manila, is a thriving and busy metropolis. The Lechon Party is a wonderful expression of hospitality extended, welcomed guests whenever the occasion is something special. Something special indeed is the Tinakling dance. The bamboo, symbol of life, demands the nimble of foot as well as head. Hawaii, it's the hula, of course. The luau party derives from the Polynesian feasts of the far islands of the Pacific, where nature is so kind so much of the year. Nimble of foot? Yes, indeed. Who said this was a dog's life? If you want to watch the entire film, as I said, uh, these films are available at Prelinger Archives. Um, so if you search for Wonderful World 1959 or Wonderful World Prelinger Archive, uh, it should pop up in, in a Google search and you can watch it, you can download it, you can edit your own portions, uh, you can um, if you, do, do whatever you want with it. Um, have fun. Um, <clears throat> now, um, because of the situation that we're in, I thought we'd go back uh, domestically uh, f to end up the program. Uh, this is a 1930s film featuring the Civilian Conservation Corps when uh, the country was suffering severe unemployment problems. The film is titled Nationwide System of Parks. Now, if you go to a park, of course, you know many of our parks were um, uh, built up and constructed by the Civilian Conservation Corps in the 1930s. And it may be that we need such a um, organization now to get out of this mess that we're in. So I thought it would be interesting to profile um, the CCC here, but also they travel around the country and, and they visit, they, they show them working to uh, fix, uh, to create parks, the parks that all these many years later we're still enjoying um, when we travel domestically. So here is a nationwide system of parks. the chief concern of the American government was to break the back of a bad depression. Among the conditions to be remedied were two President Roosevelt recognized at once. Employment for hundreds of thousands of young men and war veterans was imperative. Havoc wrought by soil erosion had long since shown the necessity of the immediate restoration, conservation, and further development of the country's natural resources. As one solution for both problems, the organization and work of the Civilian Conservation Corps was undertaken. And in two years, through this unique plan, both problems were well on their way toward solution as great aids to economic recovery. The saving of natural resources was conservation pure and simple. One important phase of the development of these resources was more than that. It was the making of a nationwide system of recreational areas, smaller, more numerous state parks, closer to the people, more easily accessible for their use, supplementing the magnificent national parks.
Conservation work in all its many phases is being done in these state park areas from one end of the country to the other. Better facilities for forest firefighting are being provided through the building of truck trails, fire lanes and observation towers, and the stringing of communication lines. Speed is imperative in fighting forest fires, quick discovery, the quick spreading of the alarm, and roads to reach the scene of action. Dead trees and tangled dry undergrowth are being cleared from the forests where necessary to prevent the starting of fires. An aggressive war is being waged on the insects, which slowly but surely are destroying natural beauty in our wide open spaces. Tent caterpillars are a menace to our forest lands. And beautiful meadows and fields are constantly being stripped of their vegetation unless the hungry grasshoppers are fed poisoned bran. The value of modern tree surgery in saving our forests in special situations is being liberally attested. Planting is another important conservation measure. Seedlings, literally in the millions, are being set out to replace trees ruthlessly destroyed. Shrubbery is being planted on slopes and hillsides to stop soil erosion. More spectacular is the moving of matured trees for landscaping purposes. There's a world of power in this mighty movement, men and machinery, old Dobbin and even his more picturesque brethren. The restoration program, which is an important part of the park development plan, represents another form of conservation. Historic events in the life of the nation are still marked by an old fort here, an old mansion there, and other material evidences associated with things of importance that have happened. Restoration work is saving or conserving more vividly than would be possible in any other way general knowledge of these events. Historic parks have great spiritual and patriotic recreational value. Old Fort Frederick near Hagerstown is being restored as a center of attraction in one of Maryland state parks. It is a most interesting veteran of three wars, the French and Indian, the War for Independence, and the War Between the States. On Bogue Banks near Moorhead City, North Carolina, the Civilian Conservation Corps is doing another job of repairing the ravages of time. At Fort Macon there, the sea and the wind have been destroying one of the masterpieces of early military fortifications. On this site, for 200 years, forts of one kind or another have protected this strategic point from invasion from the sea. The present fort required 12 years to build. When completed sometime after 1824, it was considered the last word in coastal defense and cost the then amazing sum of $463,700. In active commission during the war between the states, it was seized by the Confederates in 1861 and recaptured by the Union forces the following year. The walls are of brick and mortar, four feet thick, and they're rock solid after more than 100 years. Arches, garrison rooms, and ammunition magazines attest the artisanship of its original builders. The Civilian Conservation Corps under National Park Service direction is restoring many of the constructional details of the old fort. Here, as in all National Park Service work of this character, exhaustive research is done to ensure that the restoration is accurate and authentic. Not only the fort, but all the immediately surrounding property is being improved to make it more accessible and interesting to the thousands who visit it each year. An interesting state park in Georgia surrounds the one-time home of Alexander Stevens, vice president of the Confederacy. Long ago, the memory of this outstanding southern statesman was honored by the erection of a statue on his home estate. Now the mansion with its slave quarters and outbuildings is being restored, and the grounds are being made more attractive to visitors. Strict attention is being paid to details. Reproductions of the hand-wrought hardware originally used are being made by Conservation Corps enrollees under skilled direction. 
Along Georgia's subtropical coast are many memories of a Spanish civilization which marked this part of the world a century before Jamestown. On the banks of a moss-draped canal between Savannah and Brunswick, Santo Domingo State Park is being developed with these crumbling oyster shell walls as a center of interest. The National Park Service's painstaking investigation of the history of these beautiful and interesting old ruins is still in progress. Here's the first town in Ohio being restored. Schoenbrunn, beautiful spring near New Philadelphia, was founded in 1772, abandoned in 1777, and the site rediscovered many years later. The government's rehabilitation program is transferring citizens from localities in which they have been finding it difficult to make a living into more desirable surroundings. Its most vivid illustration in relation to the general conservation movement is in the case of farmers whose lands have been destroyed by soil erosion and one crop farming. This program is pertinent to the park plan because much of the non-productive land being abandoned is being transformed into parks and recreational areas. In the functioning of the Civilian Conservation Corps plan, however, there is another and even more interesting form of rehabilitation. Among hundreds of thousands of young men and war veterans enrolled, there have been many unable to read or write. Others whose schooling has been interrupted were found to be slipping in the matter of education and morale. The important job of mentally rehabilitating this extremely valuable cross-section of the manpower of the country has been entrusted to the Office of Education, Department of the Interior. Competent instructors in Conservation Corps camps conduct classes in many of the educational branches. The boys are given the opportunity to go to school just as they might have done years ago. In addition, there are many practical manual training courses intended to prepare the enrollees for happier and more remunerative work when their association with the Corps has ended. Many of the Conservation Corps camps communicate with each other over shortwave radio sets for both transmission and reception, which the boys themselves have made. Do the enrollees welcome these opportunities? Well, a field report not long ago disclosed that in a single Conservation Corps camp, within a single month, five enrollees, in their joy at knowing for the first time how to use them, spent a big share of their $5 cash allowances for fountain pens. Chipmunks, squirrels, and all the other little brothers of the forest, which we expect to see in our journeys outdoors, have a very definite place in nature's scheme of saving and rebuilding. Without them, there could be no real conservation. All too few of us are concerned about the rapidly progressing extinction of wildlife in the United States. We may know of the spectacular passing of the buffaloes from our western plains, where they once provided a fresh meat supply so essential to the accomplishments of our pioneering forefathers. But we do not know that the extinction of not only these buffaloes, but also the little chipmunks, squirrels, beavers, skunks, and even snakes, most maligned of all wild creatures, has for a long time been making even our present day lives more difficult to live. This without mentioning the truly heroic service many of our native birds perform in checking the depredations of crop destroying insects. The preservation of wildlife is an important part of state park planning. In many of the Conservation Corps camps, great friendships have been developed between the boys and the natives of the areas. In the Conservation Corps development of state parks is found a perfect blending of conservation and recreation. Besides protecting and saving land and timber and wildlife, this phase of the program develops recreation areas for people who have not had them before. Many kinds of work are required to develop this recreation plan. Hundreds of dams will make lakes in regions where large natural bodies of water are unknown. Hiking and bridle trails wind through the parks. Each of these trails being constructed by the Conservation Corps in state parks in 42 states is carefully placed by expert park planners. So the natural growth of the area will be harmed as little as possible, and yet so points of interest can be reached. Splendid views few men have seen because the peaks were inaccessible now open up as these trails lead hikers to the mountaintops.
Racing brooks and deep streams are spanned by rustic bridges of good design. They are built by skilled labor and conservation corps enrollees according to plans of graduate engineers and architects. Though thousands gather in the parks to enjoy these new recreational facilities, the old parking problem is no bother. Adequate spaces have been provided. Camping is encouraged and every outdoor convenience is furnished. Open stoves and picnic tables are spotted through the areas these two built by the Corps and Rollies under the direction of skilled laborers and expert designers. Any health menaces that might exist are obliterated by the construction of complete water and waste disposal systems to serve all developed areas. Probably the most attractive feature of a typical state park is the cabin community, located in one of the area's desirable spots and open to visitors who want to spend a night or a week. State Park Conservation Corps companies cover the country and work through all the seasons. These snug cabins in Pueblo State Park in Colorado are going up despite the winter snow. Recreation buildings and picnic shelters are state park essentials. This one stands on the moss-draped banks of the Black Edisto, one of South Carolina's loveliest low country streams. In some sections, notably the southwest, park development runs more strongly than elsewhere to building operations. In a country as large as America, the characteristics of the various regions differ widely. Indeed, in these differences is found the nation's charm. There are mountainous areas covered with fresh green trees and dripping with clear, cold streams. In other sections are vast ranges and plains of rock, and still elsewhere are the lowlands that stretch down to the sea. The natural features of the state parks vary with the regions in which they are located. In each section, there is a different recreational appeal. It follows, then, that a park's development plan generally conforms to the features and requirements of the surrounding country in order that the park may best serve the peculiar recreational needs of the people in its particular locality. In Texas, where nature takes on a rough magnificence, many of the required park structures are built of stone. Here is the land of the cliff dwellers, and National Park Service architects have designed park buildings to recreate a prehistoric atmosphere. This recognition and further development of the architecture typical of the history and natural characteristics of the country's several sections is important in emergency conservation work. Building trails, cutting fire lanes, and protecting and improving timber and land make the conservation work program essentially one requiring well-directed massed manpower. But on the construction project, skilled labor is necessary. Carpenters, bricklayers, plumbers, and electricians are hired from the community in which the camp is located. These men work on the park jobs with the Conservation Corps boys as helpers. Not only does this furnish employment for skilled labor and get the job well done, but it provides the enrollees with excellent opportunities to learn trades. Splitting handmade shingles is a colorful task. The tools for splitting the blocks are ingenious, as are also the appliances devised for holding the shingles during the finishing processes. And almost every camp has its own village blacksmith plying his fascinating and still useful trade. So it is all these factors join forces in this unique phase of the recovery program, a federal aid project to save and enjoy a country, to keep nature unsullied and unspoiled wherever possible as a healing retreat from the increasing difficulties of modern life, a project directed by that government agency which has given the world the American National Parks, the National Park Service of the United States Department of the Interior. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. So glad you could join us. Thank you. Oh, oh, thank you very much. If you'd like to see more Hedrick Pippermill um, vintage movie nights, uh, let me know and we can uh, do more programs with the different themes. Thank you all for coming. Vintage movie night with the